So welcome everybody. My name is Alicia Ford and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a National Disability Coordination Officer and I work collaboratively with ADSET, which stands for Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Dharawal people and I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I acknowledge their ongoing connection to country, land and sea. I encourage you, if you would like, to put in the chat the lands that you are from, as well as your pronouns. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Hitches from Griffith University and Justin Wiley from Central Queensland University, who are on our UDL Symposium Working Group and have kindly agreed to put these workshops together. We will include recordings and resources on the Padlet after the session. If you need captions, please press the CC button at the bottom of your screen. This session is being recorded. So now I will hand over to you, Elizabeth and Justin. Thank you so much. I'm Elizabeth Hitches. My pronouns are she, her. Um, on this rather wintry day in New South Wales, I'm wearing a black jumper and I have brown hair. I feel very, very honoured to be working in this particular group and also to be a teacher of inclusive education at Griffith University. And we really hope you enjoy these workshops today. Would you like to introduce yourself, Justin? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, g'day, I'm Justin Wiley. Um, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm a balding, bearded learning designer from Central Queensland University. Um, my campus is uh, Bundaberg, but I'm actually based off campus uh, in Harvey Bay. Um, and yes, like Elizabeth, I'm um, feeling very grateful to be here and share any ideas um, that we have. So what we're going to be looking at today is how we can create a really accessible and inclusive experience for our participants. So the theme of this symposium is UDL, and we want to also be sure that we're modelling that in the way that we present. So we're going to have a look at how we can use the template that AdSets developed, some tips around presenting, and also for those doing those pre-recorded presentations. And then, of course, we're going to take a look at the accessibility checker in PowerPoint and have time for some questions as well. But first of all, I'm going to hand you over to Justin to talk about using the template. So what we're going to talk about um, first up is uh, when you're creating your PowerPoint presentation, um, AdSet have uh, designed a great template, uh, master slide that you can use or a master PowerPoint that you can use. And when you're creating a presentation, it's important to, um, to reduce the need to fix accessibility afterwards is to use the slide masters and create a new slide and add the ones in that have already been made. Um, it not only gives a consistent look and feel for the presentations between themselves, but if you do need to make changes, like you do want to uh, enlarge your headings or anything like that, um, it allows for global changes to be made at that level as well. Um, Next slide, please. And um, if you're uh, adding um, titles to slides that you've made, um, use the titles, uh, the, sorry, use the placeholder that's already in the template. Um, avoid manually adding text boxes that look like a title um, because you're gonna have to fix them later. So that's where that one that's in the slide master make use of that. Um, Make sure you use each, uh, you set each slide title as something unique um, and descriptive about what's going on with the page. And if it's a series of slides, just add a two or something like that at the end, just to show that it's a sequence um, and that people know where they're up to, uh, you know, in a given topic. So yes, uh, Elizabeth, if I could, um, if I could share now, please. Thank you. Hopefully you're seeing my PowerPoint. Yes. Um, okay, so this is the, the a presentation template that's been provided and AdSet have already set up a whole bunch of different um, slide examples down the side, which you can copy and modify and delete out the ones you don't need. But just reminding you that um, if you're going to add new slides, go up to this um, new slide button and then look at the options you've got there and you can see then that, um, oh, I don't know where I added that. There you go. It's got its... Uh, it's got all the places, uh, all the uh, placeholder text boxes ready to go and an area to pop in your image and add your objects, etc. there. 
So I'm sure people are probably aware of this, but we just want to make sure that for the different levels, um, that if people aren't experienced doing that, that they understand um, that this allows people using assistive technology to easily read the slides and access the information the same as uh, people who are accessing it um, without assistive tech. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'll reshare our slides. Okay, so that takes us on to considering the text that we're using. So it's a really good idea to have that font size set to 20 points or larger, and also to use a sans serif font. So that means using things like Arial or Calibri, not something like Times New Roman. And for anyone who hasn't come across that term before, that serif font means that each of those letters have little decorative tails attached. So if you've got a letter T or a letter I, there are little extra bits attached to that letter, which can make it a little bit challenging to read. The sans serif font means without serifs, and that's where we get that Arial and Calibri. If we're going to be creating emphasis on our slides, it's a good idea to use bold rather than turning to options like italic, underline, or all caps, because bold is a more accessible way of adding that emphasis. And to think about if we're conveying meaning, not to do so simply through color alone. So if we're coloring particular words, suggesting that that color means something, Think about if that colour was taken away, would that meaning still be present? And we can actually do that in Accessibility Checker, checking our um, colour contrast and turning colour on and off and seeing if anything's missing. So we'll show you that later. Also think about the language that we're using on the slides. Is it clear and concise? And additionally, we want to be sure that it's also inclusive. So we want to be avoiding things like deficit language. So if you're Talking about a particular group, so perhaps students with dyslexia or students with a disability, we wouldn't be referring to these as students suffering from dyslexia or suffering from disability. There are also a few different views on how we can use language, particularly around concepts like disability. So you might like to explain your language choices if you're using person-first language like students with a disability or if you're using identity-first language like disabled students, but making sure that explanation's there so people know what your language is implying and intending. Now, thinking through hyperlink text, we want to be sure that any text that we do hyperlink or create those links to is actually meaningful. So we've got an example on the slide that compares something like understanding accessibility and having that hyperlinked as opposed to something like see here and having here hyperlinked. Because if people are using assistive technology, these links can actually be read out of context. So we could have a list of links being read out that says understanding accessibility, something else and something else. And that would be much more informative than if someone hears a list of here, 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 here. You're not going to know which here that you actually wanted to click on. So make sure that it's meaningful text that you're hyperlinking. Also consider how people are going to access that particular link. So you might have something on slide for people to access later, but you'd want to be sure that you are also placing that into the chat. And you may even consider having a QR code on screen too. So having multiple ways that people can get um, access to that particular link. If relevant, you can also use link shorteners so that when a link is read out, it isn't a whole mess of letters and numbers. You can actually shorten it down to something. And what we've got on the slide under the shortened link hyperlink is a link to a company called Bitly. And Bitly, you can use it freely and you can create very short links. So you might have something like bitly.com slash accessibility, and that would be as long as your hyperlink would be. So it makes it much more accessible, especially if it's being read out. Now, if we're using hashtags, it's really good to consider using something we call camel case. It's an unusual name, but I think it's to kind of reference that, that up and down bumpy nature of the camel's back. So we want to be sure we're not using all lowercase letters in our hashtags if we're combining multiple words. So if we we're doing something like hashtag inclusion rules, we'd want to capitalize the R and capitalize the I. So capital in I for inclusion, capital R for rules, and that just helps with the readability of that particular hashtag. It's also useful if you're putting multiple words together, but they can actually blend and merge into other words. So if you had um, 
I can't think of an example, but you don't want to have words that blend together and make it difficult to read. I'll think of an example for next time. Okay, over to you, Justin. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so next we wanted to talk about images, figures, graphs and diagrams that you include in your presentations. Um, so for any images, photographs, we need to provide alt text or alternative text uh, to describe what's going on in the image. Um, now, they should be added for each non-decorative visual element. So some items that don't require an explanation that are just decorative, you mark them as decorative, and that means that a screen reader won't read them out. Um, but you can actually add the alt text by right-clicking on an image, selecting alt text, or select the review in the toolbar, uh, check accessibility, and then add alt text. And that alt text should be concise, meaningful, and context-specific. So um, it needs to be descriptive about what's going on. If there's text in the image, you need to explain that as long as it's something that's, you know, that's relevant to the context of the image. Um, and when you're manually creating figures and diagrams in PowerPoint, as you can with smart objects or different shapes that you might group together, um, that becomes an issue for people with assistive tech because of all the different elements, even when you group it and add alternative text. So a great way to get around that is to create something, select it, copy it, and then paste it back with one of the, uh, when you right click and go paste, you have several little paste options. And one of those is paste as an image. And so that means it just puts it as a static, which uh, you can add alternative text to as well. Um, now, talking about diagrams and things like that, sometimes they're not like a photograph, which is just a very simple concept. And the alt text is, um, enough to give the context and an explanation. If it's a complex image like a diagram, an infographic, or a graph or something like that, um, you want to make sure that you've provided a text alternative in some way. And in PowerPoint, a great place to do that is down in the um, notes section. So just referring to that figure or whatever, you, you know, labeling it, referring to it and adding that extra detail down below. Um, and just to mention another way around that um, grouping objects is to use a snip tool and just copy a part of your screen and then delete out, delete out the object and paste it as an image as well. Um, and so also thinking about um, with the images we add being representative and inclusive in the choices we make. So showing diversity of age, gender, disability, and culture. Um, using adequate color contrast. So using the accessibility checker that um, Elizabeth will be showing you shortly. Um, and there are other, there's online versions. You can download a program. I have one called, uh, it is called Color Contrast Analyzer, Color Contrast, sorry, Analyzer, which is free to download. And it just lets you check anything you're using in different programs for the appropriate contrast level. Um, and make sure that you compress pictures via picture format on the toolbar to reduce file size when sharing um, and apply that to all images because some users, again, with UDL focus, there's people coming from different areas with bandwidth and um, limitations, et cetera, and we don't want to make an unnecessary burden on them to download uh, the presentation to be able to access it. So just being aware of that as well. Um, now, Again, Elizabeth will show you with the accessibility checker, the reading order. Um, so this is when using either the read aloud function, um, uh, the immersive reader within PowerPoint or um, assistive tech, other assistive tech, the reading order is the order that's gonna be presented to that person. So um, just need to make sure that it's set um, in a logical way that makes sense um, for people accessing it uh, via assistive tech or in, a different, in diverse ways. Um, making sure you use the use of space. So don't cram, don't make your slides too complex with too much information. Use that white space because it um, helps people take information in and not get overwhelmed visually. Um, and when pre-recording, be mindful of what will be covered up um, by your camera image. So we clarified in the last presentation that you can move your, um, your video section around, uh, but the slides have been designed so that the video can appear in the top right corner um, so it doesn't cover up the ad set logo as well. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Justin. Okay, so imagining that you've used that template, you've got all your content on those slides and you're ready to present. 
these are our top tips for presenting. So lights, camera, action, it's all happening. One of the things to think about is adequate lighting. Now, not all of us have those really fancy ring lights that people use for selfies. So if you find that you're in a dimly lit environment, what I like to do is to just use a lamp. And I find that if I position that lamp, behind my laptop or behind my computer monitor that I can get that light that illuminates me and helps me to be distinguished out against quite a dark background or a, um, a dimly lit background. Also consider how you're positioned in that camera view. So you want to be as much as is possible positioned with your head and shoulders visible. Try not to be positioned too far above that camera looking down or, you know, too far looking up. Think about how that positioning is going to look. Also think about um, how much of you is visible in that space. Consider your camera background. So making sure that you can be visible against that background, that it's not too complicated and busy and you get lost in there. You can also have some really simple solutions for that. So what I do is I use the blur background function on Zoom. So I'll show you what it looks like when I turn it off. So I can turn off blur my background and what you'll see is that I have a series of lines behind me for my cupboard doors. You'll also notice that my hair is a little bit fuzzier. <laughs> so the benefit of using that blur function is it blurs out the background, also smooths your hair out too. So top tip if you're getting ready for your presentation. <laughs> okay, the other thing to consider is the audio quality. So think about um, how clearly that you can be heard if you're using a new microphone or a new technique tested out ahead of time and you can always do a short recording to check with that and play yourself back and see how clearly you can be heard. There are also ways to reduce background noise so we can do that ourselves in a physical room so closing out pets getting ourselves into that quiet space. There's also the option to reduce noise on Zoom. Now, I believe that automatically it's set to reduce that background noise, but it's a good thing to check. So when you receive these slides, that hyperlink for Zoom settings for noise reduction will take you to that page. And it can actually be very effective. So I was presenting a little while ago and had a pile of books on my shelf fall down and I was the only one who heard it. Nobody else did. That Zoom function blocked out that background noise. So I highly recommend checking that that feature is turned on for you. And my slides will not move on. So sorry, bear with me a moment. There we go. Okay, so the introduction. You're ready. You're about to introduce yourself. Think about how you can make that personal connection with the audience. And if you're comfortable to do so, sharing pronouns can be a great way to do that. You can also think about how you visually describe yourself. And for anyone who hasn't done that before, it can feel really awkward in those initial stages. So something that helps me is to really contextualize that visual description. So I find that I feel much less awkward if I say something like, you know, on this particularly warm, sunny day or on this wintry day and then describe my clothing and then describe what I look like. It's a nice way for me to ease into that visual description. Depending on the mode that you're presenting in, also consider acknowledgement of those who might be joining live or watching the recording, because in very UDL fashion, we want to be sure that no matter how our participants are interacting with this presentation, that all audience members know that they're valued. Justin. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, housekeeping. Um, so you would have noticed at the start of this session that Elizabeth set up the, the protocols, the, the ways, um, uh, suggestions on alternatives and diverse ways to communicate and to ask questions. So again, thinking really UDL. Um, telling people that they can share in the chat, that they don't have to have their camera turned on if they don't want to, um, but just providing options uh, as to how they can ask questions. Um, now, to keep on track, it's great to uh, use a parking lot strategy, which means that any questions that come up that are great and you want to get back to, you can either um, have them in the chat marked, ask someone to mark them as a, a parking lot question or maybe have a shared document that's available for the presentation or more a workshop if you're doing a workshop and people can pop their um, issues out their questions into there um again i've already mentioned the camera on, on or off just being inclusive and understanding people with diverse backgrounds um may or may not want to turn on their camera for different reasons that's okay um and recognizing and welcoming people in multiple ways um 
that they can participate. So, you know, recognising people who are watching the recording later, um, you know, when you're talking about something, um, being aware to uh, describe something visually that you've just um, dem uh, shown people as well during the presentation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, something to be mindful of and something that I always have an issue with myself is the pace of speech. The more nervous I get, the quicker I talk. Um, so just be be aware and, um, you know, maybe have someone mention to you quietly on the private chat that you're speaking too fast. Um, gesturing is something to be aware of because depending on how much you gesticulate, um, it can be distracting to some people, um, you know, neurodiverse. What uh, viewers um, can find that, you know, uh, distracting um, but also be aware in the camera that if you can't see your hands in your um, gesturing that you it, it may look a little bit odd if you if you're only up to here and you can't see what your hands are doing. Um, so when you're presenting make sure you present your powerpoint as a full screen so slideshow in the toolbar from the beginning um, and if you're sharing a video clip or audio clip um, remember to share your computer audio in your share settings your share screen settings and also pop the link into the chat so that if there's any technical issues, your own bandwidth drops out or um, any of the participants do, that they can still access that recording or video um, via the chat. Okay, so we also want to be sure that we're explaining key terms. So any key terms that we have on slide, um, being sure that we are aware that people come in from different fields, from different backgrounds and levels of understanding, also um, different levels of English comprehension. So explaining those key terms helps be sure that everybody's going to be on the same page as we go through the presentation. As Justin mentioned, describing those images, figures and diagrams verbally, so not just having them on the slide and ignoring them, but incorporating that description into your discussion. And just as you would on the slides, bringing that inclusive language into your own verbal presentation as well. So keeping in mind how you're going to be using language and using that consistently throughout. So on your slides and um, presenting live or recorded, having that inclusive language. Over to you, Justin. Oh, sorry. Catch up. Um, <laughs> so uh, for when, if you are pre-recording a uh, presentation, um, just make sure that you're recording in a quiet environment. Um, consider doing a short recording, just listening back. Is the audio clear? Do you need to, as Elizabeth said before, is there something you need to do? Shut something to make sure that the location is not giving you too much background noise. Um, are slides appearing as you intended? Uh, is your camera image covering something that it shouldn't be? So do that little test and then go back um, and do your recording so you don't have to re-record everything. Um, if we're recording in Zoom, you can pause the recording if needed and come back to it, have a drink of water or a little break and come back in. Um, something that uh, came up from our last session was I use Camtasia to record. So when I'm recording, if I do mess up, which never I do regularly, I'll actually do a clap um, and then I see a little spike in the audio line in Camtasia when I import the file and it shows me where I need to do my cuts really quickly. Um, so that's something helpful just to to get you through that, those retakes. Um, you need to provide an edited transcript of the recording as um, an ad set will do closed captioning. Um, so just make sure that when you're recording your uh, your Zoom, uh, when you're recording it, that you use, if you're if you're using Zoom to do that, that recording, that you use the auto transcript option, and then you can edit that out later. Um, you can also run it through uh, Office 365 online um, and that'll do a transcript as well and there's other options available. Um, and present as you would live. Um, so don't fall too far into the trap of re-recording things for that perfect thing. You know, it's real. UDL is all about just doing what we can. So making sure that you don't, you know, don't spend too much time. Just, you know, keep it real um, and, um, yeah, and have fun. That's the important thing. Enjoy doing what you're doing. Okay, um, so we also have some resources if anyone would like to follow up. AdSets provided these also in the Padlet and Justin and I have also added some of our own in. So some resources you can follow up with around accessible content, including one at the bottom of the slide that talks about writing good alt text. 
And what I really like about that particular resource is it shows one image in three different contexts and talks about how alt text would be assigned to each of those different contexts. So you can see the differences and see what the target of that particular language is. There are also some um, different resources around recording, so how to record in different functions. And, of course, you can get in touch um, and we'll have some contact information at the end too if you have some more specific questions. Okay, but considering that not everyone who is with us here live or watching this recording back may actually have used things like Accessibility Checker in PowerPoint, we're going to give a quick demonstration so you can see the functionality and also have a look in real time at how that works. So Accessibility Checker in PowerPoint is going to flag for us a number of accessibility barriers that may be present. Hopefully, using that template, we have minimize those as far as possible and not added in too many, but it'll flag some for us. It's also good to be aware of those issues that won't be flagged. And so we're also going to talk about that too. So you can keep an eye out for yourself. Now we are going to have a link in the chat, which is going to go to our practical demonstration slides. And if we have time, we can also do a bit of a test out on some demonstration slides as well for you to have a play with. But what I'll be doing is sharing the practical demonstration slides and showing you through that. So I shall stop sharing and get that next screen loaded up. Okay, so you should be seeing the inside view of my Microsoft PowerPoint at the moment. And this won't be shared to full screen because what we wanna do is make sure you can see those inner mechanisms of PowerPoint and where we're going to find the accessibility checker. So I'm going to minimize my screen here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to review, which is on our um, top tab of PowerPoint. And the reason we're going to go here is because you'll see right towards the left side of that ribbon, we have a check accessibility feature. So let's go to check accessibility. As soon as we click check accessibility, we then get an additional tab pop up. And that tab is called accessibility and it opens a ribbon up of various different options. You will also notice that what will pop up on the right hand side of your screen is something called accessibility. And I think my mouse keeps disappearing. Sorry about that. Okay, so if we take a look, we've got some errors that are being identified and also some warnings that are being identified. So let's start with the errors. And one of them says we're missing an object description. So something somewhere obviously doesn't have alt text or it might be a decorative image that hasn't been marked as decorative. So, sorry, my mouse keeps disappearing on me. Okay, let's open up the missing object description. And it's telling us now, as soon as I click on missing object description, that we're actually having some sort of issue with picture four on slide four. So as soon as we click on that, it's going to take us to it on the slide and also give us a range of options. So the recommended actions, we can either add a description or we can mark as decorative. So if we click on add a description, what we can do is add alt text. So you can have a go at generating alt text and it'll automatically give you an alt text description and then you can check it. So in this case here, we've got an image of a person who's typing on a computer. We might see this and say, actually, it's more specifically a laptop. So I might come in here, change it to a person typing on a laptop. And now close the alt text and that error has disappeared. So now let's have a look at the next error, which is missing a slide title. So it's telling us on slide two, we're missing a slide title. If we click on slide two, now the interesting point here, it looks like we have a slide title. So how has this happened? Well, we've probably gone and inserted a text box, increased the font size and made it bold. So we've made it look like a title, but in fact, it's not actually formatted in the system like a title. So if it's going to be read out by assistive technology, it won't be recognized as a title, it'll be recognized as ordinary text. In this case, we want it to be a title and we've got a couple of re recommended actions here. 
So we can set it as a slide title. We can add an additional slide title if this is not in fact our title, or we can even add a hidden slide title. In this case, we're going to set it as a slide title and that error has very quickly disappeared. So onto our warnings, we've got two here, which is hard to read text contrast and checking the reading order. And I do apologize that my mouse keeps disappearing from the screen. I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, so hard to read text contrast, let's dive in. It's telling us that on slide three, our title has some issues with text contrast. Okay, so we click on that and what it takes us to is that particular slide where we can see that the title is a medium kind of grey and the background is a light grey. So there's not enough contrast between the text and that background. So we have a couple of different actions. We can either change the font colour, we can change the shape behind it, or we could even do some text highlighting. So today, let's adjust the font colour. And I don't know why it clicked red. <laughs> I'm having some big tech problems with my mouse. Sorry about that. But either way, it has um, it has adjusted it and we now no longer have a contrast challenge. So that leaves us with one error left. If I can get my mouse to reappear, I'm so sorry about that. And that is to check the reading order. So let's take a look at where this is occurring. And it's occurring on slide two. So it's flagging that something doesn't feel right with the reading order on slide two. So let's verify the object order. Okay, so our reading order here, it's going to tell us the order in which it's going to be read out. So at this particular stage, the picture is going to be read out as an empty beach, followed by the title, followed by the content that's on the screen. So ideally what it's saying is, is this the order we want it to be read out? No, we would probably prefer the picture to be read out last. So let's grab the picture and let's move it below the title and the content. So now we have the title, we have the content, and then the picture. Let's close up the reading order and see if that problem is resolved. Okay, fantastic. It's disappeared from our warning, so we know we've resolved it. So we've got one more reading order choice to select. So slide three is apparently also having some challenges. We can verify the object order. If my mouse will allow this to happen. <laughs> okay, verify the object order. We've got our reading order pane opened. And what we can see now is that we've got a few items marked as decorative. That's great. Now it's going to read out the title. Then it's going to read out the first point of content on our slide. Then it's going to read out the third point of content on our slide. And then the second. So if someone was accessing this with screen reader technology, what they'd find is instead of it being read out as point one, two, and three, they'd receive it in the order one, three, two. So that is not the logical order that we want this to be read out in. So how do we fix this? Well, <laughs> when your mouse appears on screen, you can then do that. What we're going to do is readjust the order of these places. So content one, that's fine. Our next placeholder, that we want to be read out last. So we're going to click our up and down arrows to move that piece of content to the last place. So if I can just get my mouse to reappear momentarily, now we're going to have it read out the title. We're going to read out the first point, the second point, and the third point. So that has fixed our reading order challenge. We can close it and see, yes, okay, those issues have been fixed. Now, if we wanted to check the color contrast of something, we can simply go up here to our ribbon and there's an option to inspect without color. So if we click inspect without color, what it does is it turns our slides to black and white and we can then see, are we communicating things through different aspects rather than just color alone? So if this was a figure or a diagram or a piece of text, we can check that when that color is removed, that we don't lose meaning. And if we do lose meaning, of course, we can then take steps to be sure that we have multiple ways of accessing that particular meaning that doesn't just rely on color. Okay, so perhaps for those who are watching the recording, I might 
share to our practical activity PowerPoint. Okay, so very much like before, we've got a, another slide deck, which is meant to look presentation ready, hopefully a bit exciting and a bit engaging, but hidden within it, it does have a number of accessibility barriers. So what we can do is we're gonna open up Accessibility Checker. So just like before, we can head along to review in our top ribbon, in our toolbar. We can then head over to check accessibility and that opens up our whole line of options for different things that we can check and also opens up that accessibility pane on the right. So anyone playing along live, um, how have you gone so far with this particular step? Have you found Accessibility Checker? Fantastic. Hi guys. Can I jump in? Yeah, of course. This is, this is Amy Schoberg here. I don't have my camera on because I'm um, joining from my phone. So that's another accessibility thing to think of is that not everyone has access to play around. So, so I'm actually, yeah, I'm in front of my laptop now, but I'm not joined through my laptop. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to ask if those slides you mentioned were in the Padlet, which I've got open, but I couldn't see which column they are in. Um, has anyone else seen the one that you said that you shared in the link? Uh, the Zoom oh, link yes. here and what I can in do, the chat. Um, yes, and also, the I think it looks like a great. Yes, but I can't Sorry, get you that go. on my laptop. I can't get that on my laptop because it's in the chat. Oh, um, okay. It's in the fourth, uh, the fourth column. Um, Workshop resources work, for yeah, presenters. That's it. Um, which, right at the top I can, I can email it to you, Amy, if you like. Practical demonstration slides. I mean, if it's in there, I'm happy to find it. I just I saw several things in there. So yeah, um, test, test out test out accessibility checker on inaccessible. Okay, yeah. there we go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Let us know when you're ready to go. We can all play along at the same yep. time. <laughs> yep. I'm good now. <laughs> Hopefully, everyone else is too. Thank you. Fantastic. So all we've done so far is we've gone to the toolbar at the top of the PowerPoint. We've clicked on review and then under review, we've clicked on check accessibility. And what that's done is opened up a new tab on our toolbar called accessibility. So we've got a lot of different options on that ribbon. And we also then get the um, little pop out, what would you call it? Pop out window um, section on the right, all about accessibility too. Okay, now I do realize my mouse keeps disappearing. So I apologize, that's a real challenge if anyone's trying to follow along, but hopefully it stays visible for long enough. So looking at our set of accessibility challenges here, we have um, some missing object descriptions, missing slide titles, hard to read text contrast, and check the reading order. And also hidden within these slides are some additional um, challenges that would not have been identified. So just like before, if I can get my mouse to appear for me, that's not very accessible for me. <laughs> We're going to have a look at the first error, which is missing object description. So we click on miss, missing object description, and that reveals where that issue is occurring. So we've got picture five on slide one. If we select that option there, picture slide on five one, we get presented with a range of recommended actions. So those recommended actions are to add a description or to mark as decorative. So let's have a look at adding a description. Now, even though this may be a decorative feature, it may also be something that we want participants to be aware of, that we've got that set of magnifying glasses because perhaps it sets a bit of that contrast, uh, a bit of that context and vibe of what this is about. So we're looking for accessibility challenges. So the magnifying glasses can be a nice addition to that. So in our alt text, we could type something like um, magnifying glasses on a yellow background. Okay, so once we've got our alt text in, we can close that down and see has the error disappeared? Yes, it has. Fantastic. So let's move on to our next error, um, which is missing slide title. So if we click on missing slide title, we can see that slide two and slide four apparently are missing titles. So if we click on that slide two option, 
what it's going to do is take us straight there. So similarly to the last presentation slides, it looks like a slide title. So it's probably in a text box that's been inserted. That text has been resized and bolded, but it hasn't actually been recognized as text in um, as a title in that styles function. So if someone was accessing it with screen reader technology, it wouldn't distinguish it from other text in terms of what that function is. So this is a very simple change. All we have to do is set it as the slide title and that's that error completed. Now let's have a look at slide four. Now slide four doesn't actually have any titles here present. We definitely don't want to set that text box as the slide title because that instead is our content. So this time we're going to actually select to add a slide title. So in this case, as soon as we click add a slide title, we get a slide title box pop up, a bit like we have on that template, that title placeholder. Now this content slide is all about checking accessibility. So we might call it something like um, accessibility checker. Now, as soon as we've done that, that error now disappears. So we've resolved that issue very simply and very quickly. Let's have a look at our next um, accessibility barrier, which is hard to read text contrast. So at this, I'm sure it's on the same slide. As soon as you click on it, it should say it's a text box on slide 14 or slide four, sorry. And I'm just gonna wiggle my mouse so it reappears for me. <laughs> okay, so this text box, if we click on that text box, we get a range of different actions. So we can change the font color, we can change the fill, we can also remove that highlighting. In this case, let's have a look at the font color and let's change it to something that's going to contrast nicely with that highlighting. So if we change it to something like black, great. That warning has now disappeared. So we know that that contrast issue has changed. If we instead change it to just a slightly darker color orange and it still didn't contrast well enough with that yellow background, we get that warning message still remaining and we'd have to go back in and try something else to make that resolve. Okay, and that leaves us with checking the reading order. So slide three and slide four, we're going to check the reading order. Let's start with slide three. Okay, and our recommended action is to verify the object order. So how is this going to be read out? Okay, at the moment, we've got a decorative object. We've got a sketchy line. We've also got our content and then the title. So logically, it doesn't make sense for the content to be read out before the title. So we're going to switch that order around. So what we can do is click on either the content or the title and use the little arrows in our toolbox on the side to move that up or down. So in this case, we wanna move that content to be read out after the title. And now if we close that reading order pane, that particular issue has now disappeared from our warnings list. Let's do something similar for slide four. So on slide four, we click on that um, check, reading check reading order slide four. We then verify the object order as soon as my mouse reappears. <laughs> verify the object order. And we can see with this particular one, again, we've got that content being read out for the title. So it's very simple for us just to click on that title or click on that content in our reading order pane and use the arrows to shuffle it up or down. So in this case, we've now shuffled it so the title comes before that text box. So if I close it, that then gets rid of all of those things that PowerPoint has flagged, but it doesn't mean that it's removed all of the accessibility challenges. How has everybody gone following along with that demonstration? Any challenges so far? I'm not entirely sure that it's the same for Mac as it is for Windows. <laughs> That's really good to note. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. And, and Anita, like I said in the in the chat there, um, it's something that we need to consider, Elizabeth, about um, presenting you know, for, for Mac people as well because mm, very true. All, not all Windows. <laughs> very mm. true. Mm. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left. So what I'm just going to do is flag some of the issues that Accessibility Checker hasn't found for us. 
So let me have a look. And I believe slide two, if I can flick along to slide two. So the accessibility checker will not find those challenging text fonts for us. It'll allow those to just be. But we know that we want that sans serif font. We don't want that really elaborate decorative font with all those tails and those letters. So on the slide, we've got the acknowledgement of country, which is in a very cursive font. All we do is go in and change that font to something like Calibri or Arial. Now, we also have an image on screen, which if we have a look at, where's our alt text box? If we have a look at the alt text, it hasn't been flagged because it, it has alt text attached, but it's a good idea to check what alt text is attached to each image. Because with this particular one, we have an image that is looking like a, a bird's eye view of the Great Barrier Reef, but the alt text that's attached to it is instead saying grey and blue patterns. So this would be an example of alt text that was not very meaningful and not very context specific. So we'd want to go back in and want to change that. Um, the other point to mention is that we also have that hyperlink on one of our final slides where only the word here has been hyperlinked. But what we would like to do is have more meaningful text hyperlinked. So we could instead hyperlink the check accessibility tool words if that's what's going to be, um, where that link's going to direct us to information about that check accessibility tool. 